Welcome to Wemis 1988 Classifications and Labeling. The purpose of this module is to describe the different classifications of controlled products and container labeling requirements according to Wemis 1988 standards. After completing this module, you will be able to describe the Wemis 1988 classification structure, state the six classes of controlled products in Wemis 1988, identify the hazard symbol assigned to each class, division, and subdivision in Wemis 1988, State the two most common types of Wemis 1988 labels, describe a supplier label and a workplace label, and describe the requirements of using Wemis 1988 labels. Wemis uses classifications to group chemicals with similar properties or hazards. The Controlled Products Regulations specifies the criteria used to place controlled products within each classification. There are six classes, with some having divisions or even subdivisions. Each class has a specific hazard symbol to help people identify the hazard quickly. Please pay special attention to the hazard symbols associated with the classifications. The ability to recognize and interpret Wemis hazard symbols is crucial for your personal safety and the safety of others around you. The first classification is Class A. Compressed gases, which includes liquefied gases, non-liquefied gases, and dissolved gases. The hazard symbol is a cylinder or container of compressed gas surrounded by a circle. Any controlled product that is normally a gas is considered to be a compressed gas if it's placed under pressure or chilled and is contained by a cylinder. Compressed gases are dangerous because they are under pressure. If the cylinder is broken, it might move at great speeds, becoming a danger to anyone in the area. If the cylinder is heated, the gas may try to expand, damaging or exploding the cylinder. Leaking cylinders are also a danger because the gas leaking out can be very cold and may cause frostbite on contact with skin. Liquefied gases remain liquid when pressurized inside a cylinder. As the cylinder empties, a portion of the remaining liquid evaporates keeping the pressure constant. Some examples of liquefied gas are nitrous oxide and carbon dioxide. Non-liquefied gases stay in a gaseous state, even under high pressure. Examples of non-liquefied gas include oxygen and helium. Dissolved gases have been mixed with another material, with the purpose of stabilizing the gas. An example of a dissolved gas is acetylene. Note that additional dangers may be present if the compressed gas has other hazardous properties. For example, since propane is a compressed gas that will burn easily, it will have two hazard symbols. The one to show that it is a compressed gas, and another to show that it is a flammable material. When handling Class A, compressed gases, make absolutely sure that your container is secure at all times. Never allow a compressed gas cylinder to hit the ground with force. Keep materials away from sources of heat or flames. Never allow a compressed gas cylinder to heat up. And remember, empty compressed gas cylinders are not really empty. Always treat them as you would a filled cylinder. The second classification is Class B, flammable and combustible materials, which includes flammable, combustible, and reactive flammable materials. Class B has divisions 1 to 6. The hazard symbol is a flame with a line under it inside a circle. Products in this class may be a solid, liquid, or gas. Flammable material will burn or catch fire easily at temperatures below 37.8 degrees Celsius or 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Combustible material usually needs to be heated to temperatures between 37.8 and 93.3 degrees Celsius, or 100 and 200 degrees Fahrenheit, before they will burn or catch fire. Reactive flammable materials may suddenly start burning on contact with air or water, or may react to air or water to make a flammable gas. Let's look at the divisions of Class B. Division 1. Flammable gases can ignite easily and burn very quickly. An example of a flammable gas is hydrogen. Division 2. Flammable liquids can catch fire at the surface. 
in the presence of an ignition source below 37.8 degrees Celsius. Some examples of flammable liquids include gasoline and kerosene. Division 3. Combustible liquids can catch fire at the surface in the presence of an ignition source between 37.8 degrees Celsius and 93.3 degrees Celsius. An example of a combustible liquid is diesel. Division 4. Flammable solids are solids that can readily catch fire, not including an explosive or blasting agent. Some examples of flammable solids include common items such as matches or oily fabrics. Division 5. Flammable aerosols are substances packaged in an aerosol container that will emit an aerosol mixture of the flammable substance. An example of this is a can of butane. Division 6. Reactive flammable materials can spontaneously heat up or combust when exposed to air, water vapor, or water, and include substances that release flammable gas on contact with water. An example of a reactive flammable is celluloid. When handling Class B flammable and combustible materials, always store in appropriate spaces. Be aware of the possibility of spontaneous combustion. Use in well-ventilated areas to help decrease any buildup of potentially flammable gases. Keep materials away from sources of heat or flames. Be certain that local electrical services are safe and working properly. And be aware of the possibility of static discharges. In certain circumstances, you may need to wear special clothing or keep equipment grounded. The third classification is Class C, Oxidizing Materials. The hazard symbol is the letter O, with flames on top of it inside a circle. Fire requires oxygen, and while some oxidizers do not usually burn themselves, they may help sustain or increase a burning fire by providing more oxygen for combustion, or may cause spontaneous combustion of materials without a source of ignition, such as a spark or flame. Other oxidizers, such as the organic peroxide family, are extremely hazardous because they will burn as well as provide oxygen for the fire. They can have strong reactions that can result in an explosion. Examples of gaseous oxidizers are oxygen and ozone. Examples of liquid oxidizers are nitric acid and perchloric acid solutions. Examples of solid oxidizers are potassium permanganate and sodium chloride. When handling Class C, oxidizing materials, store them away from combustibles such as wooden shelves. Keep materials away from sources of heat or flames. Wear PPE when dealing with these materials to protect your eyes, hands, and face. Be certain that local electrical services are safe and working properly. And be aware of the possibility of static discharges. In certain circumstances, you may need to wear special clothing or keep equipment grounded. The fourth classification is Class D, poisonous and infectious materials, which include materials causing immediate and serious toxic effects, materials causing other toxic effects, and biohazardous infectious materials. Class D has divisions 1 to 3, and each division has a separate hazard symbol. The substances found in Class D have a negative effect on the human body, with different substances having different danger levels, ranging from temporary irritants to carcinogens to poisons. Their effects may not be immediate either. In some cases, symptoms may not appear for years after exposure. Division 1, materials causing immediate and serious toxic effects, are very poisonous and immediately dangerous to life and health. The hazard symbol for Division 1 is a skull and crossbones inside a circle. Serious health effects such as burns, loss of consciousness, and coma or death within minutes or hours of exposure are grouped in this category. Most Division 1 materials will also cause long-term effects that are not noticed for months or years. Examples of Division 1 materials include carbon monoxide, sodium cyanide, and sulfuric acid. Division 2, materials causing other toxic effects, are also poisonous, but may or may not have immediate effect. The hazard symbol for Division 2 is a T with an exclamation point at the bottom inside a circle. If the effects are immediate, they will probably be temporary. However, materials that do not cause immediate effects may still have very serious consequences, such as cancer, allergies, and reproductive problems 
or chronic effects such as irritation and or sensitization resulting from small exposures over a long period of time. Division 2 has two subdivisions called D2A, very toxic materials, and D2B, toxic materials. While it is not a legal requirement for WMIS subclassification to be reported on the MSDS, nor is it a requirement for classes D2A or D2B to be distinguished on the label, it is often possible to make this distinction using the health hazard information on the MSDS and or the label. Products are typically classified as D2A, very toxic materials, if shown to be carcinogenic, embryotoxic, teratogenic, mutagenic to reproductive cells. Reproductive toxic is a sensitizer to the respiratory tract or causes chronic long-term toxicity at low doses. Products are typically classified as D2B, toxic materials, if shown to be mutagenic to non-reproductive cells is a sensitizer to the skin, is an irritant to the skin or eyes, or causes chronic toxic effects. Examples of Division II materials include asbestos fibers, acetone, and lead. Division III biohazardous infectious materials are organisms and toxins produced by organisms that can cause diseases in people or animals. The hazard symbol for Division 3 looks like three C's joined together with a little circle in the middle, all inside of a circle. Included in this division are bacteria, viruses, fungi, and parasites. Biohazardous infectious materials are usually found in hospitals, healthcare facilities, laboratories, veterinary practices, and research facilities. Workers in these places do not usually know if tissues or fluids contain dangerous organisms and must treat every sample as dangerous with proper protection in place at all times. Examples of Division III materials include the AIDS HIV virus, hepatitis B, and salmonella. Working with biohazardous infectious materials requires specialized training. Protect yourself from these substances. Ensure your protective clothing and equipment is appropriate. Avoid direct contact if possible. Avoiding future disease is worth the momentary discomfort of wearing a mask or gloves. Remind yourself that the few minutes spent putting on protective equipment now will ensure your quality of life in the future. When handling Class D poisonous and infectious materials, always wear appropriate protective clothing and avoid skin contact. Division 1 materials may be absorbed directly through the skin. Avoid contact with eyes by wearing glasses, goggles, face shields, or chemical hoods or suits as required. Avoid ingestion. After handling, be sure to wash your hands before touching food or drink. Avoid inhalation of vapors or dust. When in the presence of Division 1 materials, always wear appropriate respiratory protection. Ensure that your environment is well ventilated. And, be aware of all first response measures in case an incident does occur. For example, know the location and how to use an eye wash station or emergency shower. The fifth classification is Class E, Corrosive Materials. The hazard symbol is two test tubes pouring liquid on a bar and a hand with lines coming off of them inside a circle. Corrosive materials can cause severe burns to skin and other tissues such as the eye or lung as well as damage other materials including metal. The damaging effects of corrosive materials are permanent. Note that irritants whose effects may be similar but temporary are grouped in Class D, Division 2. Examples of Class E materials include acids such as sulfuric and nitric acids, bases such as ammonium hydroxide and caustic soda, and other materials such as ammonia, chlorine, and nitrogen dioxide. When handling Class E corrosive materials, take the same precautions as described for Class D poisonous and infectious materials. The sixth classification is Class F dangerously reactive materials. The hazard symbol is a test tube with sparks or lines coming out of the tube surrounded by a letter R inside a circle. If a material is dangerously reactive, it will most likely be described as unstable. Most of these materials can be extremely hazardous if they are not handled properly because they can react very quickly. 
Materials in class F may do any of the following. Undergo vigorous polymerization, producing heat and pressure. Explode if exposed to shock, pressure, or heat. Undergo condensation to form a different substance. Or release toxic or flammable gas on contact with water. Examples of dangerously reactive products are ethylene oxide, anhydrous aluminum chloride, and picric acid. When handling class F, dangerously reactive materials, keep the materials away from heat, store them in air and waterproof containers, keep these materials in areas designated for storing highly reactive materials, avoid shock and friction, and, in the case of water-reacting materials, make sure the appropriate fire extinguishers are nearby. Here is a review of each Wemys 1988 class of controlled product, including hazard symbols. Let's move on to look at the labeling requirements of Wemys 1988. Labels are a vital part of the Wemys system, allowing a worker to quickly identify the hazards associated with handling a hazardous product. Labels are designed to provide important information in an efficient and highly visible manner, and include items like the hazard symbols assigned to the product. A Wemys label can be a mark, sign, stamp, sticker, seal, ticket, tag, or wrapper. It can be attached, imprinted, stenciled, or embossed on the controlled product or its container. Two types are used most often. There are supplier labels and workplace labels. Supplier labels are attached to the product container by the supplier. Supplier labels must have a hatched border around the information on the label. They must display French and English. Information in both languages may be within one border or two separate borders. When separate borders are used for each language, hazard symbols must be depicted on each. No regulation precludes the use of other languages within the border. Supplier labels should be durable, easy to read, and prominently displayed on the container. A supplier label must appear on all controlled products received at workplaces in Canada. It has to include the following information within the Wemys hatched border. The product identifier, which is the name of the product exactly as it appears on the container and SDS. The supplier identifier, which includes the contact information of the company that sells the product and is responsible for the label and MSDS. A statement that an MSDS is available for the product the hazard symbol or symbols assigned according to the product's classification, risk phrases, which are words that describe the main hazards of the product, precautionary measures concerning how to work with the product safely, and first aid measures describing what to do in an emergency. The supplier label is all that is required as long as it is fully legible and in place. We will now discuss the workplace label. Workplace labels are affixed to a product container at the site where they are being used. Workplace labels are required if the product is made in the workplace, the product has been put into a new container, or the supplier label becomes unreadable or is partially or fully removed. There are two situations where a workplace label may not be needed after a product has been transferred to a new container. These are when the product is going to be used immediately or when the only person using the new container is the person who filled it. A workplace label must appear on all controlled products produced in a workplace or transferred from a supplier container to another container. The language displayed on the workplace label can be determined at the workplace. It is not required to be in both French and English. A workplace label may appear in placard form on controlled products received in bulk shipments. Workplace labels must include the following pieces of information. The product identifier, which is the name of the product, exactly as it appears on the original container, supplier label, and MSDS. Information concerning safe handling, storage, and use of the controlled product. And a statement that an MSDS is available for the product. These are the minimum requirements for workplace labels. The employer may wish to put more information on the labels than is required under the law. For example, a workplace label may or may not include the Wemys 1988 hazard symbols or their pictograms 
or the hatched border used on the supplier label. Employers and employees are all responsible for labeling or relabeling controlled products in the workplace, as directed in occupational health and safety legislation. An employer should ensure that all products arriving on-site are appropriately labeled and workplace labels are created and used when needed. Workers should understand the meaning and importance of the labels and how to interpret their contents, follow procedures for creating and attaching workplace labels, avoid damaging labels or removing labels, and report damaged or missing labels to their employer. It is very important to ensure all applicable labels are attached to all controlled products used in the workplace. Without proper labeling, it can be very difficult for even experienced workers to be aware of all hazards associated with a particular product. Understanding and using WIMIS 1988 labels can help prevent injury or even save lives. Let's review a few points. Here is an example of a supplier label. And here is an example of a workplace label. This concludes the WIMIS 1988 Classifications and Labels module. Please complete the short quiz before continuing to the next module.